Our sermon scripture for today is taken out of Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 37. But before I get started, I'd like to say that today, in this day and time, as it seems, more and more people are becoming concerned about the end of days. We see it on social media, we hear about it on the news, we hear about it in our towns. There's just a lot of chatter and a lot of worry about it. I've heard of people looking to the weather, they're looking at the natural disasters around the world, the impending wars or the rumor of war, the rumors of so-called famine, shortage of food nature itself. They're looking at all these things to give them clues. So that's why I turned my studies this morning not only to the scripture for today but also the scriptures before. So I did this in order to see that if we as Christians need to be keeping a watchful eye to the world around us Or is there, in fact, something Jesus himself tells us to do that is totally different, that we need to be aware of, or we should be doing? So to begin, I would like to recap on what was going on just prior to our scripture for today. And I'm using chapters 11 through 13. Because as it seems, chapters 11 through 13 are a continuous movement of Jesus and his disciples as they travel from Bethany to Jerusalem and back again. And during this time, Jesus teaches through many parables. And he also, I found it interesting, he cursed a fig tree because at one point, while he was traveling from Bethany to Jerusalem, he became hungry. And because this fig tree was not producing fruit, he cursed it. It was also a time where he flipped the tables in the temple for corruption and misuse of the temple. It was where he was questioned by authorities because they did not like what he was saying. It was also the time that he gave the greatest command. He also gave many warnings. Just prior to our reading for today, he warned the disciples to watch out for several different things. And that's because the disciples seemed to be in awe of the world around them and what they had seen. Because as they were going through this town of Jerusalem, they saw the massive stones of the temple. They saw these beautiful, magnificent buildings. And they began to look at them. So Jesus gave these warnings. And he described them as the birth pains of the beginning of end times. He gave these warnings that people would say, I am he. There would be rumors of war. There would be nations that would rise up against nations. There would be earthquakes in various places. There would be famines, persecutions, arrest. There would be brother against brother, father against child. There would be claims of false messiahs, false prophets. These false prophets would do anything to deceive us. But remember, Jesus said that these are the birth pains. These are what come prior to the end times. That is why he repeatedly also said, watch out. Do not be alarmed. 
Be on guard. Do not worry. Do not believe it. There was one other thing he said. He said, also, that the gospel must first be preached to all nations. He said, I have told you everything ahead of time. And even tells what will happen in the days to follow. That leads up to the Son of Man coming down in a cloud with great power and glory. So with that, I will read Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 37. <clears throat> Where it says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So the whole reason I took time to recap on what was going on prior to our scripture is because the lessons that Jesus taught through these scriptures and that we are to learn from are all tied together in these words. I want us to notice the first things that Jesus said. He said, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. He's telling us to not become so preoccupied with the signs or the birth pains in anticipation or fear of this final coming of Christ. <coughs> and that is because, excuse me, <coughs> if we do, <coughs> we become deceived. We begin to read too much into these signs. And that's when these false prophets, the false teachers, will lead us astray. And when we become distracted, we produce no fruit or little fruit. And we can spiritually wither away. Because it really does impact us. We become less prayerful. <coughs> we begin to have doubts. We become more concerned with the outside world and the signs than we are the wonders of God. For example, Peter, when they walk past this tree again, and he saw it, he noticed that it was withering. So he became more aware of its withering than he was the majesty in what Jesus had just did by cursing it. Another example prior to the scripture is in chapter 13, verse 1, where the disciples became so in awe of their surroundings, they turned to Jesus and said, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. They were not concerned about the works of Jesus at that moment. So I find it amazing that he not only tells us that no one knows the day or the hour, that is, no human can predict it, no one has any way of knowing. But also he says that not even the angels in heaven 
nor the Son, but only the Father. So only God, in his planning and in his timing, knows. That means he will not tell even the closest to him. He will not tell his son sitting at his right hand. He won't inform the angels. The highest angels in heaven don't know. So this should bring us comfort in not knowing. Because it's basically telling us that we should not become so consumed with trying to figure out the date or time. We should not be looking for signs of the birth pains because it's God that knows. We should just have the faith that Jesus had. But we should be on guard. We should be alert because we do not know the time or the hour. In the next few verses, Jesus compares the day and hour of the second coming to that of a man going away and leaving his house and putting his servants in charge. Each assigned to their certain task, telling the one at the door to keep watch. I think Jesus, with his amazing authority, Use the appropriate analogy here. Think about it. Jesus himself came as a servant of God. He fulfilled every duty God himself commanded him to. He became a servant to all mankind. Jesus humbled himself. The very Lord came down from heaven and placed himself in a lowly position of a servant. Is that not what God wants us to do? Are we not servants of God, ambassadors of Christ? We are all given a assigned task, but we all have a task that is in common. And that is to go out and make disciples. In other words, to spread the word of God. From the day that Jesus ascended into heaven, we that chose to follow him became servants of God. We became servants of his kingdom here on earth. But we are the servants at the door. And that's because we have the keys to the kingdom in heaven. We know Jesus on a personal level. He's the master of our temple. So we must keep watch. But we must continue to to do our duties, proclaiming the word so that others can have the key as well and become servants of God. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. We need to see that sleeping servants can't perform their duties. So their job or their jobs go left undone. I want us to realize that every generation since the time that Jesus spoke these very words and gave the sign of the birth pains have thought that they were in the end times. 
That is because since Jesus spoke these words, throughout time, there have been people proclaiming to be God or Jesus. There have been wars. There have been rumors of famines. There's been nations against nations. There's been earthquakes. There's been false prophets. And as a result, each generation began to look for more and more signs. Just as we are now. The truth is, is that we have been in the end times for over 2,000 years. Since Jesus ascended into heaven, we have been in the end times. Looking for Jesus to return. But our duties of watching are not over. Look at what Jesus said in 13.10. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. That's not been done yet. There are still people out there who don't know of Christ. There are many tribes that have not been witnessed to, witnessed to yet. I read of one that still practices their old ways of performing to their gods. Look into witchery or sorcery to heal. They hold ceremonial worship to their gods. So our job is not done yet. Notice what it said in verse 30. He said, Truly I tell you, the generation will certainly not pass away until these things have happened. This verse right here, I believe, has been one of the most misinterpreted verses of the Bible since it was spoken. Because as human, we want to take this literally. And we assume all this will come to pass in our generation, our lifetime. We will be here to see Christ return. The truth is, that's what the disciples assumed as well. But we know that they passed away, and so has many generations since then. But I'd like to offer y'all as an answer to what this scripture means is the generation of the new covenant. Because the whole purpose of Jesus returning or coming in the first place was to give mankind a way to be in relationship with God by becoming a servant, going to the cross to be the final sacrifice, to end the old covenant. We are the generation of the new covenant. The time will come when Christ returns. but not until the servant duties are done. So my question to all of, the, all of y'all is, as followers of Christ, are we sleeping? Is Christ, the owner of the house, going to come back and find us asleep? Have we become so consumed with looking for signs of his impending return that we've been deceived into making them a priority instead of completing the task he set before us. Many will argue the answer is no. And that's because they do their due diligence as Christians. They read their Bibles. They pray regularly. They meditate on the word. 
They go to church. These are all great things, but is this what our assignment is? So are we asleep? I want us to think about it, really. As followers, we're comfortable enough to fall asleep, especially here in America. We no longer fear persecution. We no longer have to decide whether or not we're going to practice martyrdom. As a result of that, we have lost our zeal for Christ. We no longer have the scriptural zeal that they did in biblical times or in the early church days. We are warm and cozy in our homes praying. We're warm and cozy in our churches praising. We're warm and cozy in our daily lives. So cozy, in fact, we might have fallen asleep. Or maybe we're just merely sleepwalking. Going through the motions. So it appears that we're trying to accomplish something. When in fact, we're running in circles. Not accomplishing much at all. Except personal spiritual growth, which is great and well. But it's also selfish. I know that not everyone is called to be a missionary or an evangelist. They don't feel the desire to go to different countries and proclaim the word of God. That's not for everyone. And there are those that are called. But how many times throughout each day are we not presented with the opportunity to spread the word? If not the word, then blessing. To show the light and the love of God. And yet, how many of us, myself included, bypass those very opportunities? Yes, we pray. We do all the little things expected of us Christians. But we're missing the major mark. We hold the keys. They've been given to us, not to hoard, but to share. We as Christians all know the ending, and that is Christ will return to take his bride. We know the bride is the church. The church is the people. (coughs) But we are also his temple. So my question, upon Jesus' return to his temple, when he enters, is he going to find corruption, discord, sleeping servants, and flip the tables again? It is his desire for all people of every tribe, every tongue to be with him in heaven. So we need to wake up and continue our duties. Yes, we could be on guard. We could be alert, aware of the signs. (coughs) All while continuing on our task. Well, we do not need to become so consumed and worried or alarm, fear-stricken, that they pull us away from our main goal, and that is spreading the word. And that is why Jesus said in verse 37, What I say to you, I say to everyone. Watch. Jesus said, watch these things unfold. Be on guard so that we do not become so consumed and led astray and forget as he has told us to do. We need 
to end the cycle of sleeping servants. Because it has gone on for far too long. Many generations has followed the same cycle. When in fact, we are told over and over again through scripture what our assignment as his servants are to do, is to do. And that is to go out and proclaim the word of God, adding to his kingdom. So that when he returns, every knee will bow and all will pray. We need to start doing the work again. We need to teach our children and our grandchildren what it truly means and takes to follow Christ. So that if it's not in our lifetime that Christ res returns, they will know how to continue on with the duty set before them. We need to see that Jesus led by example so that the followers of him in that day and time would know what to do. Just like our children and grandchildren follow us. We need to lead by example. We need to show them that even if the world around us seems to be in a self-destructive mode and all the signs point to the end, that is not the time for them to be fearful or alarmed, but it's a time to stand firm and proclaim the word of God. We need to become more fervent, more passionate about doing so. We need to end this cycle. We should be Willing to invite all who will listen. Because it is his desire that every human join with him. No matter their race, their language, any of that. God wants all his children to be with him around his table to join in with him at his great feast that he has prepared for us, made possible only through the shed blood of Christ. Amen? For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Amen.